this. There we go. And the title is on the first slide, so I won't read it out, but uh, please go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, neural networks with some random parameters. And uh, this project is a little bit outside of what I usually do for research, but I think it's a cool project which was recently finished, so uh, I chose to talk about it. All right, I'm going to start real slow uh, so that we can all the all the proper um, notation can be introduced. So uh, since we're talking about um, neural networks, well, we take our uh, idea from biology, from actual neurons, which have uh, dendrites, have received a signal from other neurons, and then they accumulate it in the center. And once it reaches a certain threshold, it gets passed through the uh, cell, um, through the axon to the next one. And uh, well, we take this idea and we make a model for it. Right, so this is now the model. We have our input signal X, which lives in n-dimensional space. And then we multiply it pointwise to take in a product with the input weights here, uh, which sort of model the um, sensitivity of dendrites. And then we compare it to its threshold. And then we take our activation function of what we got. Um, so activation function, if you think about biological model, is just read a step function, right? So we, there is no output until the threshold is reached, and then it's it's output of one. But uh, we usually like to work with smooth things in mathematics, so um, some smooth uh, version of this function is usually used. So here, for example, it's um, this one. Um, and a whole bunch of different um, can be used. So use so sigmoid, but there's this whole list of uh, things that people usually use. Um, well, we're gonna have a pretty generous assumptions for this activation function. So throughout the talk, um, it's gonna be one of the, these two things gonna be assumed. Either we assume that our activation function is um, L1 and until O2, so it decays pretty fast. And then for some results, we're going to need some continuity also. Or we're going to assume that it's differentiable uh, and its derivative is in L1 and L2. So one of the two things will, will suffice. Um, so th those are pretty general assumptions and um, all the known functions, at least if you truncate, it, uh, if you truncate those functions, they will fit. This one of the two, um, two sets here. Um, then, uh, OK, so we have a model for one signal neuron. And it doesn't do much, right? And there's not many functions which we can represent in this way. So what we can do, we can organize a few neurons together to form a layer, like um, here on the picture, right? So each one of those is, is one neuron. So it has its own input uh, weights, its own threshold. And then we organize this, the outputs of each neuron with the output coefficients and sum up all. And then you can get even more rich constructions by iterating this, by adding more and more layers on top of each other. But for this talk, we're really going to focus on one layer networks. Um, so we're going to consider this set of uh, functions. And then uh, the question we're going to be answering today is uh, what class of functions can be approximated with this Fn? Uh, so in other words, we want to take some uh, set of functions we want to work with. And we want to ensure that for any function from the set, um, well, the limit of the error of approximation will go to zero as we take more and more neurons in this layer, this hidden layer. And uh, well, this question sort of was already answered um, and pretty long time ago. So Barron in 1993 showed that if we um, take any function which is um, continuous with a compact support. Then there exists a sequence of this uh, single layer networks such that the approximation error not just decays to zero with the number of uh, neurons on the hidden layer, but does it at the rate of one of a square root of n. Um, well, it uh, pretty much, I could finish my talk here, right? So the, the question is answered. Uh, well, there are a few problems with this. Um, one is that well, this is a symptotic result, right? So this is a hidden constant here, which we don't know what it's like. So if we want to apply this in practice, we need to know how exactly many uh, neurons we need to take on the hidden layer to have a well, precision we would like to have, and we, we don't have this. Mm -hmm. 
but uh, this I will address a little later. Uh, the other problem is that, of course, well, it's existence result. And in practice, we just don't not happy with um, the existing approximation. We need to construct the actual approximation. So for this, we need to find the weights. So the input weights, the thresholds, and output weights. Um, so in principle, we need to solve this problem if we're given the function f and want to construct an approximation. In practice, we don't have the actual f. We have a training set. So this is sampled from the domain of the function points paired with the values of the function of those points. And knowing just this t, um, we need to well, basically solve the, the same problem. We need to find weights so that the, that, um, the neural net is a nice approximation of our function. And uh, well, this leads to uh, an um, optimization problem, but the problem is that um, we have this weights for the input weights and the thresholds uh, inside the raw function. And the activation function raw is not very nice. It's not convex usually, so it's a hard, um, hard problem of non-convex um, optimization. So there are algorithms which allow you to do this, but they usually have slow convergence. They can stack in local minima. And we, in, in we actual setup, when we have the training set, then they're also very sensitive to the distribution of these xi points in, through the domain. In the ideal world, we have this xi spread uniformly throughout the domain of f, but that's not going to happen. Usually in practice, you would have some clusters and have some empty spots, and uh, this is all bad for this uh, optimization algorithms. And uh, also there's a certain common belief that maybe there are too many weights here. Maybe we don't need this many. Maybe we can get away with a fewer. So that's the idea. Uh, let's just optimize part of the parameters and keep other others fixed, right? And since we were bothered by this um, parameters inside activation function raw, let's keep those fixed. So let's um, just fix their values to some favorite values of ours and only optimize output weights and see if it's enough. Um, and this question was answered as well uh, by Baron a long time ago, 1993. Um, and we have a um, similar result, right? So we still have that the error of approximation goes to zero with n. If we fix omega i's and b i's, so input weights and thresholds. But now uh, the power here of n depends on the ambient dimension m, the dimension of the input signal. And if we're dealing with the signals of large um, dimensions, so if our function f we're trying to approximate is defined on large dimensional space, then this, this 2 over m is effectively 0. And this is effectively constant. And even though formally our approximation error does converge to 0, it does it so slow that it's just use, useless. Um, so there's something, but it's not satisfactory in, at all for any application in practice. But also, if we look at this result, we see that um, it's a sort of worst case scenario result, right? So it says that if we fix values for bi's and omega's, thresholds and input uh, weights, then we can find a function for which we'd have this bad approximation uh, error. So um, the hope here is that there are not many such functions for each particular fixed omega i's and beta i's. And hopefully, if we um, see, if we take a function and look at the set of all beta i's and omega i's which are bad for this function, this is going to be a very small set. So the thought here is that maybe if we just uh, sample this um, weights at random instead of having them fixed, maybe that would lead us to something because maybe we would emit these bad sets of only guys and better eyes for each particular fixed function f. Uh, so this is um, sort of a motivation to, to have a better idea or refined idea of fixing some of the parameters and considering random parameters instead. So now we're going to have uh, randomized omega eyes and bad eyes, so it's chosen from a suitable distribution, which is still to be determined at this moment, right? And only optimize for AIs, for the output weights. So if I didn't convince you with the previous argument, uh, with the bad sets of omega eyes and bad eyes for each, um, each particular, um, uh, 
uh, function f, we try to approximate, we can think of, um, of an example which would maybe explain why it's maybe a better idea to choose a better eyes and omega isotrinal. So you think of a simple um, machine learning problem when we have two sets. Maybe let's have them like this for now. And uh, what we want to do, we want to um, well, separate them, right? So we want to uh, uh, solve the classification problem for points coming from one cloud or another cloud, by just drawing uh, one of few um, hyperplanes between them that would separate, right? So then we would optimize to find uh, the parameters of um, hyperplane, which would separate them. We may have some more complicated weights, uh, sorry, not more complicated classes, more complicated geometry. Clouds maybe, oops, sorry, it didn't work. Um, maybe something like that, right? Then it's maybe not possible to separate them with one signal hyperplane, but we can still do it with a few. But the basic idea in machine learning, and this very easy um, task in machine learning is to find parameters for those hyperplanes, right? And to define a hyperplane here, what we need is um, a pair of parameters. We need a normal, let me call it omega, and a shift. So this is gonna be normal, and it's gonna be shift away from zero. So in principle, what we have then, um, how do we decide from which cloud the, the point came? We, well, when we take some point X, here we just uh, compare, um, we'll just take in a product. So, and if this quantity is positive, then it's on one side of the hyperplane. If it's negative on the other, it's on the other side of the hyperplane. So we just take a sign of this expression and we do it for all the hyperplanes. And then we hope to get um, the idea from which cloud the point comes from the set of, of all this um, information from all the uh, planes we use, all the hyperplanes we use. But um, yeah, for this, we tune these guys, tune omega i's and beta i's. But now, uh, what if we just chose an, at random? Well, they're not gonna separate our sets this nicely. Right, we're gonna just cut through them in some in some way. But hopefully if we have uh, enough of them, we'll have little pieces of the space so that only points from one class would fit inside, right? So this is the idea behind this change in optimized parameters, which were initially, we were searching for optimal ones to random ones. If you have enough n, enough well, large enough n, then maybe um, we don't have to really carefully tune this um, well normals and uh, shifts for each hyperplane, but we can just choose them at random and hope for the best. Um, okay, so for this randomized idea, um, it's um, well, it's what's called random vector functional um, link networks. Uh, RVFL, that's what we're going to be talking about. And um, those guys were used quite a bit in practice. And so they were used for uh, handwritten um, the letters recognition, visual tracking, and many other ways. Um, but um, and in, in practice, they show quite similar results to what you have when you learn all the parameters, though the learning process is much faster. But there is not much theory around for them. And uh, that's the gap we were trying to close in this project. All right, so um, the result which was known um, about this RVFLs is again quite old and it was cited a lot because everybody who wanted to use them in practice just um, thought it's, it's nice to say something theoretical about it. Uh, is this result due to Gelnik and Paul from 95, uh, which tells us that, okay, there exists a distribution um, for the, for the this, um, thresholds and input parameters, and also um, there exist weights, output weights, um, such that the sequence of RVFLs, um, well, would uh, on average approximate the function f. Right. So, and the rate of convergence is as before. So before we had square root of n, but that's because 
this is uh, L2 norm squared. Yeah, we don't take squared here. Um, yeah, well, it turns out that this paper had an, um, a mistake, and uh, this result is not true in this form. You cannot have both zero here and the rate of convergence. What they actually proved, actually proved in this in this um, well, paper of theirs, is um, this result, right? So you can have uh, this limit to be arbitrarily close to zero. So for any epsilon, you can construct distribution for parameters, um, and um, well, then you can learn the weights. So that uh, this limit of the approximation is going to be well, it's going to be epsilon, and then you can have the rate of convergence which you had before. And here's the distribution of how you construct it. So basically, the parameters you use um, well, uh, they are distributed over uniformly over certain regions, and it's going to be clear uh, in a bit why why we choose these regions. Um, or you can show something else. If you want to have zero here, uh, if you want to have approximation not just up to epsilon, but up to arbitrary uh, precision you would like to have, um, then you can still do this, but you cannot have convergence guarantees in this case. And uh, you would have to change your um, par parameters. So beta uh, and um, now going to be depending on, on n, right? So you cannot reuse them for later n. Um, so the difference here is that, well, you, you consider similar things, but you need to now consider, so before we had this alpha and omega parameters set for all n, and now they're depending on n, so you would have to uh, have different um, distributions for each n parameters. Yeah, so you probably don't want to do this in practice, um, but, but then you cannot have um, arbitrary close approximation by just letting n grow. You need also to change the distribution. Um, all right, but still um, what is missing from this result is that it's a um, asymptotic result. Right? So we know that it converges to zero. We don't know how exactly it converges to zero. And also uh, it, it's uh, average error, right? expected error. So what we would like to do, we would like to uh, replace the statement with some statement about the probability uh, well, distribution of this error, right? So tail probabilities for this error. And we also would like to know how large n should be so that we have the desired precision of approximation. And that's uh, what our main result is about. Um, this is the statement, which is a little bit scary. Uh, yeah. <laughs> No, and uh, well, you probably have an idea already that this must be very um, technical uh, result, All right? So anyway, we have here um, any epsilon, which is any precision we want to achieve in the end, with the probability one minus eta, where eta again can be chosen freely. Um, and then if n is uh, well, here we have a bound which is very complicated and depends not only on the ambient dimension, some parameters which you already saw like omega, for example, then epsilon and uh, the, well, the um, probability precision, but also on the, how complicated function f is and how complicated function rho is, so this whole bunch of thing. Uh, to make it a little bit simpler and more uh, comprehensive, uh, this is what it actually says, right? So this is how it depends on the precision epsilon and the desired probability eta. And now we have also this constant CM, which depends exponentially on the ambient dimension M, on the input dimension. But then we can also have that, well, um, we can have this probabilistic result, right? So now that we know that L2 norm of the approximation error can be squeezed to be as close as zero as you like with high probability, with as high probability as you like by pushing N a little bit more. Um, okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about how we prove this um, result. Um, I'm not going to go into any details, of course, but um, I'm just going to deliver a general idea. All right, so our goal here is to um, have this sort of approximation. We want to take our function f and approximate it with fn in this form. All right, so we're going to achieve this uh, in two steps. 
For the first step, we're going to construct a limit integral representation of f. So the idea here is that if you take f um, and then convolve it with a drug delta function, we have f again. Well, um, so we're going to construct a series of functions which would be approximating drug delta. And then, well, we're going to have limit representation with this functions. When we take the limit, we're going to have in the limit the function itself. And then for this integral, we're going to apply a Monte Carlo method of approximation. And that's where our random weights are going to pop up from. So as a byproduct, um, we're going to have a very pleasant um, well, uh, formula for AIs. So here, the thing is that we, you don't actually have to learn AI, AJs, the output weights. If you know the function f, then you can just compute them. And even if you don't know your function f, but just know the train data, the train set, um, then still, if it's it has a good enough distribution throughout the domain of f, you, you can be good and just compute AI using formula instead of approximating, instead of sorry, optimizing and doing least squares or something. So we can save a little bit of um, computational expense there. Um, all right, so let's start with the first step. Uh, how do we construct this uh, limit integral presentation? Well, we need to, to construct this approximations of drug delta using our activation function. So our idea is to use this set of functions. So what happens here? So as um, omega j's simultaneously go to infinity, all of them, then what happens is that, um, well, this guy go to infinity. And now this guy in the argument of rho also goes to infinity. But rho is a nice function in the sense that, remember, we assumed that it was L1 and L2. So it decays when the argument goes to infinity uh, to zero quite nicely. So when the argument is large enough, and this is large enough as well, then it, it goes more and more like this bell-shaped, taller and taller, and the smaller and smaller um, domain of where it's significantly larger than zero. So then what we can show for this functions is this result. So indeed, we can check that um, f can be found as a limit of uh, this expression here, where this is just normalization factor. And then if we substitute the formula for omega, uh, for h dot omega inside here, we have this formula, right? So well, you don't have to read what is the integral um, very carefully, but that's what we wanted pretty much, right? So we want limit of the integral. And now what's inside the integral is not quite what we wanted, right? Because what we want is rho of the inner product of maybe. We want rho of the inner product of your input with uh, maybe omega vector and plus some b, uh, b right, vector. Um, and then some weights a. And then we want uh, integral of this, ideally. That's not quite what we want because, uh, well, we have this product of the of the values of um, actuation function on some um, on some arguments, which sort of look like what we want, but not exactly. So we would like to replace this product outside with the sum inside. And uh, well. The idea would be to use exponential function for all for, for this, right? Well, in principle, we want to work this for any equation function rho, and we cannot quite take exponential because it grows too fast. But we can take some uh, something different. We can take a cosine. For cosine, we have this nice identity, which allows us to translate product uh, into sum, right? And uh, what we can do iteratively applying this identity is this, right? So the product of the cosines of the uh, omega j times dj, where d dj is this difference, uh, can be translated into this. Well, now we cannot quite take cosine as a raw function because it's not L2 or L1, but we can take a truncated version of cosine, right? So we can just take a piece of the, um, uh, of the domain of cosine and set it zero everywhere else everywhere outside this, this piece of the domain. And we want to choose domain large enough so that whatever this argument can be fits inside. 
So what we need to now to do is to use a truncated version of cosine. Um, so this is going to be the size of the domain, pretty much. And then we define um, cosine omega to be this, right? So we just truncate uh, it to zero outside of this domain. Well, the domain is chosen so that it's still a continuous function uh, and compactly supported, which is going to be important. So then that's the representation we have when we replace uh, this or omega, which was arbitrary before with the cosine, uh, the truncated version of cosine. Again, complicated integral, but uh, that's already better, right? So we have this thing here, uh, which we can then push into a, a, a j's, into a coefficient, uh, the output weight. And we have a cosine applied to this difference, which is sort of like uh, in a product of omega and x, minus in a product of omega and y, which is going to be our b. So it's already close. Uh, is, but we have cosine instead of arbitrary activation function. So what we need to do, we need to do another approximation now for cosine. Um, so the cosine, the way it's truncated, it's continuous and it's completely supported. So we can have our previous lemma applied to it. Now with arbitrary activation function raw. So we have this. Now alpha goes to infinity. This um, uh, convolution approximates cosine. Uh, where each alpha is constructed in a familiar way, right? So now when we substitute this inside here, and um, well, what we have is this, right? So we have this limit integral representation, where this is going to be our AIs in, in the future. Uh, and uh, this is looks like what we, what we want, pretty much. Now uh, we have a precise formula for um, this coefficients and uh, these ones as well. So that's a uh, lemma, which is the result of our first step, limiting for representation. Uh, so next step is to use Monte Carlo approximation. All right, so now we uh, take a look at our domain over which we integrate and um, basically choose now the variables over which we integrate, uniformly distribute over respective domains, right? So we choose them in this way. Um, then what uh, Monte Carlo approximation tells us that then um, if we take this Monte Carlo sum, and now AJs can be computed like this, um, then this integral we're interested in um, is, well, the difference between this integral and the Monte Carlo approximation sum, uh, the expected um, different the L2, L2 normal of this difference can be bounded by some constant over n. Uh, where this constant, well, it's it's nasty constant, which is the reason why we have this nasty result. But what's important, it's independent on n. And uh, it's, uh, well, you can see that already some dependence is exponential in the ambient match. Um, yeah, so now, well, we have this approximation of the integral with the Monte Carlo sum. Before we had approximation of the function with the integral. So now we just need to marry two things together. And um, yeah, just basically we say that, okay, we first choose our parameters um, alpha and omega. Um, so large enough so that the difference between the integral and the actual function is bounded as close to zero as we like. Um, and then uh, the difference between function and the Monte Carlo sum, which is our RVFL already, can be bounded by this epsilon plus this error, which goes to zero at this rate. Right, so this is for, um, um, for expected error. If we want a probabilistic result, then we have to do even more work because then we need to uh, find out about the um, well tail, tail probabilities for this difference. Um, and then we need to also take care of this, uh, this difference. But yeah, um, I'm not going to go into this. Um, 
if you can imagine that's using some union balance and uh, some careful probability um, estimations you can you can you can arrive at the, the conclusion um all right so um then the question is still that okay so we're happy with the rate it's still the same as if you were um learning all the weights not just output weights but this um constant here is well it's not very nice because well it has a lot of dependencies on many parameters and uh, in particular if you look at this term and this term you can notice that it's um, exponential dependence on the ambient dimension right so if if you're um, trying to solve high dimensional problem then even though you have only n here, right? So um, you would still, because of this of this constant, you would still have to get n very large in order to to obtain the approximation rate you like. Um, but um, th this being said, well, there is looks like there is no way around it. At least if we in full dimensional support case, when the function f has full dimensional support. But it's often the case that um, in, in actual um, classification problems, that the domain of F, uh, the data domain, is not full dimensional. It's uh, rather lies on some lower dimensional manifold, which is embedded in Rm, which we may not know. Um, but still, there is a common belief that this should be the case in, in many problems. So can we somehow improve this uh, exponential dependence um, if we know that uh, we are not actually in Rm, but in some d-dimensional manifold embedded there? Um, well, it turns out that you can do something about it. Um, not much though. So uh, what we need to do, okay, so if we have now a smooth uh, compact d-dimensional manifold, Oh, um, since it's a d-dimensional manifold, if we look at it locally, it would look like Rd around any neighborhood of any point. So we can define an atlas, which is basically a cover of the manifold together with this local coordinates, which would map uh, your neighborhood um, yj to Rd. Um, and define local coordinates in this way. Uh, and uh, well, we're also going to need a partition of unity defined on this atlas. So a partition of unity is a set of functions such that support of each function is inside this um, neighborhood uj. Um, and then if you sum the value of the function at each point, you have one. Um, then what we can do, we can have this well-known result that you can then represent the function f um, is basically uh, sum over this projections of f onto uh, d-dimensional manifold locally at every term, right? So this is the projections. So this f hats are uh, completely supported in Rd. And then you can go back um, from f hats to f by, by the summation um, and reconstruct the, the value of the actual function f. And this is our plan, right? So what we can do now, we can uh, take this representation, then work with uh, f hat um, each, for each j separately, build a, a RVFL that would approximate it, and then um, compose them together. So that would be like adding a layer to our network. Um, and um, I'll have an approximation of that. So this is the plan, right? So step one would be to uh, build RVFLs for each F, F hat, um, and then compose them together. And then you have similar, can have similar results, right? So this is um, um, a subtotic result. And then you can have the version of uh, this probabilistic result with a horrible bound on N which uh, now is also enforced with this G, which is a cardinality of the atlas. Um, but, still, but you can have this um, nice representation just as you had before, right? It's some similar results. So here it's uh, average expected uh, error, but um, well, 
in principle, you can, you can also have a probabilistic result. I just didn't put it in the slide. And what is also nice here is that, well, um, this G, if your manifold is compact, um, can be um, chosen as small as this. So, which is, which has the dimension D here, um, well, we have exponential dependence on, on, on D instead of M. Um, here is a hidden constant here, which um, depend, depends on some, well, more geometric properties of the manifold like reach. Um, yeah, but we'll just hide it for now. Uh, so what you can see here is that instead of having exponential dependence on M on the big invariant dimension, you now have exponential dependence on D, which is low dimension of the manifold, which is maybe not that bad. That's not, not great, but it's not bad as well. Um, yeah, and uh, in the end, I want to show some uh, numerical results. Uh, so here, what we did is we did this manifold or VFL. Um, so this is totally synthetic. It's not on any real um, real data. So basically, we had here a sphere. We sampled points from this and the function defined in the sphere. We sampled points in the sphere, and then we forgot that they were in the sphere. And uh, you can, if you have samples of um, of uh, data, and you know that it should be on a d-dimensional manifold, but you don't know which one. There is a way to uh, construct a manifold, um, which is called geometric multi resolution analysis, which basically amounts to um, it's a refining procedure when you take um, your points from, from your um, manifold and approximate the manifold by inserting little um, RDs around RD uh, neighborhoods around each of the manifold and gluing them together nicely. Then you can uh, have different levels of approximation. Uh, or resolution levels. Um, so that's what we did. So we uh, had samples of a function from a sphere, and we put it was a sphere, reconstructed sphere using this multi resolution analysis. This is nice for this purpose because, uh, well, to use this result here, you need to know your charts, right? Because, well, you need to know them, and usually you don't. Is there something else I can help with? I'm sorry about this. Um, and uh, if you use this um, geometric multi resolution analysis, you basically have this um, card charts constructed for you with this local approximations. And that's what we get. So here we have plots, uh, different colors correspond to different resolution levels. So it's sort of the precision, precision with which we approximate the, the manifold. And um, yeah, so this is number of uh, layers on the uh, hidden, uh, no, sorry, uh, notes on the hidden layer of our network. Uh, this is the error which we get, and you can see sort of that it stabilizes pretty nicely. And what we believe um, this value is, is the precision of um, the manifold approximation. Uh, we have this dependence on alpha and omega here, right? Um, so for here you can see alpha fixed and omega varying for uh, two different um, levels, 10 and 15. And again, um, same colors, same um, approximation or resolution levels for um, geometric multi-resolution analysis network. Um, yeah, so you can see that um, it makes a difference uh, for the approximation of function when we take uh, these larger parameters, which well, ideally uh, we need to set to infinity uh, for our approximation so that uh, the desired precision is reached much, much faster uh, than otherwise if we, if we uh, have a smaller omega. Um, all right, so I finished quite a bit <laughs> faster than I, I expected to finish, uh, but yeah, that's the end of my presentation um, and uh, please let me know if you have any questions. All right, thank you very much. Let's thank Paulino.